All right, guys, we're back to finish up Benicula today. Uh, we have three more chapters left, and when we last left off, Chester was kind of starting to go crazy. He was he had worn garlic around. He was using a actual piece of meat, like a steak, to try to um, like disable the bunny, uh, and then the family threw him outside and <laughs> told him he could spend the night out there. So last we left off, he was sort of at the window looking in at Harold. Harold doesn't really know what to make of all this, and um, let's find out what happens. A new friend in need. In the days that followed, Chester's behavior was exemplary. He purred and cooed and cleaned his paws, and he rubbed up against everyone's leg to show what a good boy he was. I was getting worried. Chester acts that way only when he has something devious in the back of his mind. But I didn't know what it was. He had tried everything in the book to get rid of vampires, and all his efforts had failed. But I knew from the expression on his face that something was definitely up. Of course, I didn't know for certain because he had not spoken to me since the incident. I guess he realized that my heart just wasn't in the destruction of the in the destruction of the bunny vampire. In fact, I was beginning to like the little fellow. The Monroes were relieved by Chester's improved behavior. They didn't know how to account for his strange doings, but to their credit, they were willing to let bygones be bygones. The only disturbing factor in all our lives was the reappearance of the white vegetables each morning in the kitchen. And yet, after a few days, even that stopped, and the life seemed to return to normal. One evening, I dropped by Benicula's cage to chat. I found myself doing that more and more since Chester had stopped talking to me. Of course, Benicula didn't talk back, but he was a good listener. I'd begun to think of him as a friend, a strange one, granted, but one can't always choose one's friends. I was distressed this particular evening to see that he was dragging his ears, as it were. He looked tired and listless. I felt his nose, and it seemed a little warmer than it should have been. I became alarmed. I ran over to Toby, who was doing a picture puzzle on the floor, and began to bark. Something I only do in case of extreme emergency, since even if I do not care for the, since even I do not care for the sound. What's the matter, Harold? Toby asked without moving. Are there burglars? I ran to the cage and looked at Benicula. I looked back at Toby and whimpered. Toby just looked confused. Do you want to play with Benicula? Shall I take him out of the cage? Woof! I responded, indicating. Um, indicating I hoped that it was indeed what he should do. I'll ask Mom and Dad, Harold. You wait here. He was back in a minute, shaking his head. I'm sorry, Harold, but Mom says you can't play with the rabbit. It causes too much commotion. I looked down at the floor and whimpered again. Sorry, Harold. Maybe later when we're all in here together. I regarded Benicula, whose, um, I regarded Benicula, whose eyes met mine. He gave a little shudder. And I felt like crying. My friend was sick, and I didn't know what to do. I wished I could tell Chester, but I knew it was no use. He was just too mad at me. I would have to sort this one out on my own. That night, I couldn't sleep without worrying about Benicula. I decided to go downstairs and check on his condition. What I saw when I entered the living room horrified me. Benicula was out of his cage on the floor while Chester stood in front of him, a piece of garlic around his neck, and arms outstretched blocking the kitchen door. Suddenly, it all fell into place. Chester was starving Benicula. Of course, that's why he had seemed so listless, and that's why the vegetables had stopped turning white. Chester had made it impossible for Benicula to eat. Chester, I cried. Chester jumped a very high jump. What are you doing down here? He spat at me as he landed. I know what you're doing, Chester, and the jig is up. The little bunny never hurt anybody. All he was doing is eating his own way. What do you care if he drains a few vegetables? He's a vampire, Chester snarled. Today, vegetables, tomorrow, the world. I think perhaps you're overstating your case, I suggested Suggested cautiously. Go back to bed, Harold. This is larger than the two of us. It may seem harsh, but I'm only being cruel to be kind. Who was he being kind to, I wondered, as I went back upstairs. The tomatoes and zucchinis of the world? Maybe a few cabbages? It just didn't make sense. But if I could see, I wasn't. Go but I could see I wasn't going to get anywhere with Chester tonight. Tomorrow, however, would be another d story, and I was determined that, by hook or crook, my friend Benicula would eat by sundown the next day. Chapter Eight: Disaster in the Dining Room. I realized that there was nothing I could do for Benicula during the day since he was sleeping, but that gave me time to plan my strategy. First, I thought I would bring food to his cage. 
but then it occurred to me that Chester must be taking everything away that's given to him. Pete and Toby usually left lettuce for Benicula during the day while he was sleeping, and Chester, ever watchful, probably nabbed it each evening just before the rabbit woke. No, there would be another way. There would have to be another way. I thought and thought all afternoon, and I could see that Chester had done a good job of isolating Benicula from food. There was no way I could think of to overcome Chester's game plan. As evening drew closer, I grew more frantic. I stumbled into the dining room and saw the answer to my problem sitting before me on the table. It was a big bowl of salad. All I had to do was get Benicula to the salad and let him fill, let him get his fill before the family came in to eat. With that funny white dressing on it, they would never notice if a few of the vegetables were white. I ran to the hallway to check the clock. 6.15. It would be 15 minutes before the sun went down and Benicula woke up. I would then need at least five minutes to get him from his cage to the table to feed him. All I had to do was make sure no one came in the room until he had finished. I needed a good 20 minutes at least. I went back into the living room. Chester was asleep on his brown velvet chair, sh um, shedding in his sleep, still worn out from the previous night's activities. I checked upstairs. Toby was reading in his room, the last chapter of Treasure Island, I hope noted. Pete, who should have been doing his homework, was listening to records in his room. I ran down to the kitchen. Hello, Harold, Mrs. Monroe said as I came through the door. What's new? Other than a rabbit starving in the next room and an imminent attack on your salad bowl? Nothing, I thought. I stood, I stood at her feet and panted. She scratched my head. That gave me a moment to check out how far she was in her cooking. Sorry, Harold, she said. I have to baste this chicken. I noticed the oven timer still had 35 minutes to go. It'll be tight, I thought, but I can make it. Now, where was Mr. Monroe? I went to the front door and whimpered loudly. Mrs. Monroe followed me. Are you waiting for Daddy, Harold? He'll be home soon. Soon isn't good enough. How soon? I whimpered again. Patience, boy. He's late at a school meeting. He'll be here any minute. As she went back to the kitchen, I checked the clock. 6.25. It was getting dark, and Chester was still asleep. Time to swing into action. Having watched Chester undo the lock on Benicula's cage and having participated in that unfortunate steak episode some days earlier, I knew that I would have no problem getting Benicula out. I just had to be a little more careful where I positioned my head so that I wouldn't find myself in that humiliating predicament of getting stuck a second time. My timing was perfect. With Benicula swinging peacefully from my teeth, I made my way stealthily toward the dining room as the last rays of sunlight gave way to the dark of night. Once inside the dining room door, Benicula awakened in great be bewilderment. It is not every day, after all, that one finds oneself, upon awakening, hanging from the jaws of a fellow creature, even so caring and gentle a creature as myself. Benicula opened his eyes wide and turned his face, as best he could, to me. To me. I jumped up onto the nearest chair and placed the rabbit safely on the table's edge. Okay, I whispered. There's your dinner. Go for it. Get your fill as fast as you can, poor bunny. I'll stand guard. I don't know that Benicula fully understood what was going on, but the sight of vegetables piled high in the center of the table sent him scurrying in their direction. He was very hungry. As luck would have it, and as I should have anticipated, Chester's sense of timing was astute as my own. No sooner had Benicula reached the edge of the salad bowl than the door swung open and Chester bounded into the room. He surveyed the scene frantically. I was unable to act fast enough. Upon seeing Benicula about to enjoy his first bite of nourishment in days, Chester leaped across the table, seemingly without touching the floor, chairs, or anything else between him, himself and our furry friend, and landed directly on top of the bunny. Oh, no, you don't, he shrieked. Benicula, not sure what to do, jumped high in the air and landed with a great scattering of green smack in the center of the salad bowl. Lettuce and tomatoes and carrots and cucumbers went flying all over the table onto the floor. Chester flattened his ears, wiggled his rear, and smiled in anticipation. To cat observers, this is known as the attack position. Run, Benicula, I shouted. Benicula turned in my direction, as if to ask where. Anywhere, I cried. Just get out of his way. Chester sprang. Benicula jumped. And in the flash of a second, they had changed positions. Chester now found himself flat on his back. Owing, um, owing to the slipperiness of the salad dressing in the bowl, and Benicula, two days to even think about food now, hovered quivering on the table. 
Chester was having a great deal of difficulty getting back on his feet, but I knew it was only a matter of seconds before he'd attack again, and I knew, also, that Benicula was too petrified to do anything to save himself, so I did the only thing I could. I barked, very loudly and very rapidly. The whole family rushed through the doors. Mr. Monroe must have come home just must have just come home because his coat was still on. Oh no, cried Mrs. Monroe. That's it, Chester. This is Chester's last stand. Chester rolled his eyes heavenward and didn't even try to move. Mom, said Toady, tugging at his mother's arm. Look at Benicula. How did he get out of his cage? He looks scared. Of course he's scared, Mrs. Monroe said. We probably forgot to latch the cage and he got out. And I think Chester had been chasing him. Toby put his face in close to the rabbit. Mom, doesn't Benicula look kind of sick? We'd better take him, take them all to see the vet to see if there's any damage done, she answered. I started to whimper. No need for me to go to the vet. Mr. Monroe patted me on the head. We may as well take Harold along, he said. He's probably due for shots. Mrs. Monroe carefully picked Chester out of the salad bowl and carried him by the scruff of the neck to the kitchen. I'm going to give Chester a quick bath, she said to Mr. Monroe. Why don't you put together a fresh salad? Toby... You and Peter put Benicula back in his cage and then clean up the table. I didn't stick around for an assignment. This was not the time to be in the way. And besides, now I had the whole evening and night, my whole evening and night ruined, worried about the next morning's visit to the vet. This little effort of mine, I thought, had been a disaster in more ways than one. And now we are on to our final chapter. And just like with Matilda, I'm not going to tell you what it's called. Sometimes the chapter name ruins what happens in the chapter, like this. Looking back on that night, I remember thinking that this whole mess could be resolved happily. Could never be resolved happily, sorry. What would become of Benicula, my new friend, who was suffering from starvation? And what of Chester, my old friend, who seemed to have flipped his lid and, if you'll pardon my expression, was in the doghouse with Monroe's? A far greater concern at the time, of course, was my own future. For on that night, all that consumed my thoughts was the fear of the next day's um, injections. It all seemed hopeless indeed. But looking back on the next day, I can tell you that happy endings are possible, even in situations as fraught with complications as this one was. Early the next morning, we all piled into the car, some of us with greater reluctance than others, and trudged off to the vet. By afternoon, we were on our way to solving our problems. The vet worked everything out very nicely. He discovered that Benicula was suffering from extreme hunger. I could have told him that. Rather than jar his fragile stomach with solid foods, the doctor decided he should be put on a liquid diet until he got better. So Benicula was immediately given some carrot juice, which he drank eagerly. After he finished, he looked over at me with great grin on his face and winked. Chester was diagnosed as being emotionally overwrought. It was suggested that he start sessions with a cat psychiatrist to work out what the doctor had called a case of sibling rivalry with Benicula. I asked Chester later what sibling rivalry was, but he wasn't speaking to me. So I looked it up. It's like a bro oh, it's like a brother or sister. And sibling rivalry means that you're competing with your brother or sister for attention. I wasn't sure that this was Chester's problem, but it sure explained a lot about Toby and Pete. As for me, well, I came out the best. Dr. Wasserman was all set to give me my shots when the nurse came in with my card. Wait, doctor, this dog doesn't need shots yet. It's too soon. So I got a pat on the head and a doggy pop instead. These days, everything is back to normal in the Monroe household, almost. Benicula liked his liquid diet so much that the Monroes have kept him on it. And oddly enough, there have been no problems with vegetables mysteriously turning white since. Chester, of course, insists that this proves his theory. Obviously, Harold, the liquefied vegetables take the place of the vegetable juices, so Benicula has no need to go roaming anymore. Then he's not a vampire, I said. Nonsense, he's a vampire, all right, but he's a modern vampire. He gets all his juices from a blender. Case closed, Sherlock? I queried. Case closed. Oh, Chester? Yes, Harold? What are those two funny marks on your neck? Chester jumped and laughed. Very funny, he said as he began to bathe his tail. Very funny. The Monroes never knew anything of Chester's theory. They changed markets, and to this day, they believe that they were the victim of a curious vegetable blight. But Nicola and I have become good friends. 
He doesn't say, he still doesn't say anything, but he snuggles up next to me by the fireplace and we take long, cozy snoozes together. One night I sang him a lullaby in the obscure dialect of his homeland and he slept very peacefully. It was that night that cemented our friendship. Now about Chester. I said that everything was back to normal. Well, almost. Naturally, Chester is the almost. He has been seeing his psychiatrist, Dr. Uh, Barakat Katz, twice a week for some time now. He makes his therapy very, he takes his therapy very seriously. The other morning I was trying to get a little sleep when Chester came over and nudged me in the ribs. Harold, do you realize we've never really communicated? I mean, really communicated. I opened one eye cautiously. And in order to communicate, Harold, you really have to be in touch with yourself. Are you in touch with yourself, Harold? Can you look at yourself in the mirror and say, I know who I am. I am in touch with the meanness that is me, and I can reach out to the you-ness that is you. I closed my eyes. I'm used to it by now. He talks like that all the time. He no longer reads Edgar Allan Poe at night. And once he concluded that he had been right about Benicula, there has been no more talk of vampires. The mark of the vampire sits its, use, its usefulness obsolete on the shelf. Right now he's reading Finding Yourself by Screaming a Lot. And the other night when I heard the most awful noise coming from the basement, I didn't even bat an eyelid. I knew it was just Chester finding himself, as he calls it. He explains to me that he's getting in touch with his kittenhood. And I've told him that's fine, just to let me know when he's going to do it so I can be elsewhere. I've had enough trouble from Chester's adventures. So that's my story. And the story of the mysterious stranger who no longer seems quite so mysterious and who is definitely no longer a stranger. I've presented the facts as clearly as I could. And I leave it to you, dear reader, to draw your own conclusions. I must now bring this narrative to a close, since it is Friday night, Toby's night to stay up late and read, and I can hear the crinkling of cellophane. I only hope it covers two chocolate cupcakes with cream filling. That is the end of Benicula. Um, so they don't really tell if this he was a vampire or not. I guess that's up to you, as Harold says at the end. Um, so interesting ending to the book. And um, there are others, if you're interested, there are other Benicula books in this series. So if you're interested, check those out. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed it. Let's, um, if you have any comments, we can either talk about them in our class meeting or you can talk about them in the comment section.